Happy Halloween, everybody. So glad you could be a part of the Michael Steele podcast as you get your scare on. Uh, get ready to go out and enjoy the Halloween uh, festivities that you know Halloween is not just a day. It's it's a lifetime, right? Because we know some scary people. Uh, and that's why I'm glad you're tuning in for this conversation on the Michael Steele podcast, because there's nothing scarier than a football star and a doctor running for a uh, TV doctor running for higher office. Uh, and today's guest knows a lot about how to address the scary, the crazy, and absurd with humor, insight, and urgency. It's my friend John Fugelsang, who's an actor, comedian, and the host of Sirius XM's Tell Me Everything. He's joining us for a rather insightful and at times creepy conversation. I'm glad you could be a part of it right after this on the Michael Steele Podcast. Well, everyone, like I said, uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation because uh, this brother and I go back a, a little bit uh, of years, a few years, and John is such a real joy to have you here in the house up close and personal, baby. Thank you, Michael. It's a thrill to virtually be in your house. And yeah. uh, please don't feel creepy about that. And I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you. It's so good to see you face to face virtually. I guess this is as intimate as humans will get for the rest of our lives. Yeah, this, yeah, this is this could be us for a while. I, I really want to say, Michael, it's so good to see you in person on Zoom. You know, that's a thing now. <laughs> we're we're that disproportionately removed from human contact. I'm finally seeing you in person on Zoom. It's great. And, you, and, and your <laughs> color looks great, and your voice has never sounded better. And geez, Thank you, sir. Zoom Thank can you. be a good thing. <laughs> Listen, Zoom. Zoom is. I I like being alive and aware of these things that are changing how our culture operates and our commerce and our relationships. I mean, let me tell you about the golden era of Zoom stand-up comedy. I mean, oh. it's been a really strange pandemic when you can be doing these shows that they all look like Beirut hostage videos from the eighties, <laughs> and and you, it, you feel like you're in an AA meeting virtually. Uh, but and you realize, oh, I'm on a bill. There's a that, that guy is in Boston. <laughs> this guy's in Chicago. And I'm on, this guy's in she's in San Francisco. I'm on an international bill. But incredibly, real great comedy could still happen. What's like, the response on that? How does that how does that work from a lag time perspective? I mean, it's you all know, the, the beauty well, of comedy is the intimacy of the moment, the immediacy of the moment when you say something. And it just the audience, it just lands with the audience. Do you I get know. that sort of like, oh, okay. no, not, I mean, a little bit. What you get in Zoom comedy, I find, is you get the feeling that you're at a happening with a lot of comedians making each other laugh. You know, the weird thing in Zoom rooms is how much laughter do you hear? How much are people muted in their own rooms? It, right. It's all very weird. But in the midst of all the weirdness, I think it, it really began a whole new discipline of performance, a whole new kind of stand up talk to any comedian and they'll tell you about their Zoom comedy etiquette. Like I realized after doing half a dozen of these, I don't want to sit down anymore. I began mounting my camera really high. I brought in my microphone in a stand. Even though I wasn't plugged in just to stand there at one, just to give the audience a sense that I was here to, to, to sing for them right. and, and work it a bit. Because a lot of times it just looks like people, you know, sitting in their in their chair naked just talking <laughs> and really low energy so i mean as awful as it was i was amazed that at the ingenuity and creativity of people to try to still be funny and make people laugh during lockdown and it was amazing to see how you know this technology in its early years is being used for you know solid entertainment purposes and bringing people close together well it, it's it's interesting you 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 end it that way because I remember people saying the same thing about Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> and, now, and, and now and now that, you know, uh, Elon Musk owns it and we're in another a whole nother level of hellscape yeah. in here. Oh, it's it's great. Isn't it nice having free speech again, Michael? I, I mean, know. wow. I, and we can say Merry Christmas again, too. I, I got to tell you, these guys have really. They brought the 20th century back. It's incredible. <laughs> well, that's that's their goal, you know, that early part of the 20th century, preferably. You know, not the latter part where we discovered civil rights and human rights. Oh, not that part. No. no, we 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 like that 1950s version of it. Whereas I like to point out with uh, to folks, 
have you, have y'all talked to white people from the 1950s? Cause it wasn't that great for them either. <laughs> Do you think Elon Musk has people around him who are willing to tell him actually a private inter- internet platform kicking you off because you violated their terms isn't a first amendment violation like do you think he has people around him explaining no elon uh kicking trump off twitter because he was spreading lies didn't take away his free speech like right. it's amazing i have this argument almost every day with somebody yeah. and i'm like if i go into 7-eleven and i'm not wearing a shoe shoes or a shirt that violates their policy and they can make me leave i can still rant any crazy thing in their parking lot i want <laughs> You know, no one's been silenced by Twitter. You can still say anything you want, but it's still Elon Musk's number one reason. And I know he's not that dumb. No, he's, he's not that dumb. And, and smart as he thinks he is, but it no, seems like it, that makes me think it's all a racket, Michael. Yeah, it is. It is absolutely a racket. It is absolutely a, um, a rather nefarious one, I have to say, because I think it is how in some respects, he identifies with a lot of the bullshit that's put out there. And he yeah. wants to create that space. I mean, look at what he tweeted almost immediately. Right he away. tweeted almost immediately after he took control was right-wing conspiracy bullshit about right Paul away. Pelosi. And, you know, oh, he and this guy that attacked him, they were actually, they knew each other and maybe there was something going on in the house. From the Santa Monica Observer. Thank you. And and so he immediately retweets without even confirmation yes. or validation, and then quietly and unceremoniously takes it down when he realizes, oh, I guess that wasn't true. This is the new hellscape, folks. You better it's get wor- used it's to. worse. It's worse. You have to add, and then he mocked people for calling him out for it. Yes. He never apologized. Yes. Never took responsibility. Never said, hey, I get what you're saying about disinformation, and I've fallen prey to spreading something before checking it too. None of that, just derision for people who call him out. So and- this is this is the, you know, I appreciate what you're saying about Zoom because the difference between Zoom and Twitter is I can still pretend to be some something or someone else on Twitter. In Zoom, I can't. You, I'm looking at you, and you gotta show your face on Twitter. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta show your face. Show your, you have to be what we call a man or an adult, <laughs> and show what we call your goddamn face. Right. Not be a coward and hide behind a picture while you attack adults who never bothered you. I mean, exactly. Twitter is where everyone who never aged out of high school can go. A junior high. All the grown men who want to be mean girls can yes. go to Twitter. Yes. I, nothing against privacy, but if you're hiding your name and face, okay, and going on the internet as an adult male, hiding your name and face to attack people because they believe differently from you to try to hurt them, you're not a man. And we have normalized this cowardice as just being a part of someone's personal discretion. But no, if you're going out there to hate while hiding your face, yeah. you are... You you are an unmanly supplicant to your and own. So, you deserve to be called out for it. And so, what is it that about about men that so gets under the skin of Holly and Tucker and Cruz, these so called Republican men who seem to be so insecure about manliness. I, I don't understand what that's all of. I haven't been able to put my finger quite on it. Maybe somebody or maybe too many people put their finger on it, but I, I haven't. So I don't understand exactly what this whole fixation is with manliness and their womanly wiles of, of men. I don't know. What's up, dude? You no, know, I mean, look, I, I, you don't, you know, we could spend all day talking about insecure men through the ages and how they overcompensate. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, uh, Trump, you know, I would yeah. say he majored in this in college, except he always paid someone to take his test for him. <laughs> but, you, you know, like Trump talking about how I'm a stable genius, a person who has to keep telling you they're a stable genius is like He's a so stable. Guy, like a guy who keeps telling you he's straight, like one too many yes, times. I yes, yes, straight. You know what I mean? So you know, I remember a couple of those brothers back in the day, right? So it's look like, at Tucker. Dude, it's this, like this, this is seventh time this week you've told me this. What? Tucker Carlson is this petulant fish stick empire millionaire. He was born into it, um, millionaire at birth. Uh, privileged is fine, but privileged 
with no appreciation of the fact that one is privileged. Yeah is lethal. I mean, in his college yearbook, he literally declares himself the president of the fan club of the man who murdered Harvey Milk. That's what he chose to celebrate in his yearbook. Mm -hmm. So we know the kind of humanity we're dealing with, the kind of deeply, and oh my God, such an insecure man. Tucker Carlson will never do a live interview with anyone who disagrees with him, ever. You ever watch his interviews? They're always pre-taped. Yeah. He takes them in the afternoon, and those things have got more cuts than the cast of Girl Interrupted, Michael, okay? He is uh, just, they're, they're all cowards, these Trump-like coward child men who believe that cruelty means strength, who believe that empathy is weakness, and that compassion for the less fortunate is socialism. Right. And they only care about themselves. They've turned the party of Lincoln into this cult of corrosive uh, selfishness. Uh, and it's why the one silver lining on it is we know they will always turn on each other. When I, when we first met, we debated rather passionately about uh, President George W. Bush. Yep. Are you ever shocked at how quickly Donald Trump was able to get the white men of the Republican Party to just throw Bush over the rails oh right away? God. Oh my God. We said for years all this stuff and they hated us. Trump says it in one debate and right away, Bush is persona non grata in the whole party. Yeah, yeah, and not just Bush, but just the virtually the legacy of Republican leaders, McCain and Eisenhower. Hell, I mean, oh, these yeah. people even let that son of a bitch sit up and say, you know, I'm as great, if not greater than Abraham Lincoln. Oh, they don't uh, care. I don't, they don't care. So what what is it in your in your view that informs that that pathology, that psychology that we see not just in, in the political context but now that has been sort of bled into the bloodstream yeah. of of our culture that it's it it takes this form in wokeness on the left and um anti-democratic violence on the right how how do you assess i mean because you're a guy who's who's tapped into the culture i mean as as a comedian as a writer as an actor your stories and your experiences are sort of a reflection at times of what's going on around us. How do you assess what the hell's going on out here right now? Well, um, let me start by saying I don't know what woke means. <laughs> I know I know. three years ago it meant anti-racist <laughs> and being more aware of institutionalized right. racism. And Fair now point. It, now it's a taunt people throw at anti-racists, right. um, which I've grown up with. I mean, who... Bleeding hard liberals was what I heard when I was a kid. Got a little older, was politically correct. Well, that's just using language to not be cruel to people, right? Like, let's be more sensitive. No, it was right. social justice warriors. I'm like, well, like Christ, right? <laughs> you know, um, it, every generation finds a new way to smear kindness, trying to not be a dick. Yeah, but there is, but there is an element of that that goes beyond. I, I get oh, your yeah, baseline it's point. It's fundamentalism. It's fundamentalism. I, yeah, I think a fundamentalist distortion of Christianity is behind all of it. When you can convince people, and here's where it's going to get dodgy, but when you can convince people that Christianity is about criminalizing abortion, and that's it, right? That's what we prioritize. The reality is, Christ never mentions abortion. Okay, Christ is very specific. He's against the death penalty. More than once comes out against that and servant on the mount. Right. He, he commands individuals and nations in Matthew 25, individuals and nations, he will judge by how well they care for the poor. That's true. How well they care for the sick, how well they welcome the stranger, how kind they are to those in prison. Christ is very, very specific with what he wants us to do. Individuals and nations. Right. And this is pre-democracy. So when they got a large chunk of American Christians to believe that. Christianity is about criminalizing abortion, which Christ never mentions, which the Bible never actually gets around the prohibiting. Judaism is the religion of the Bible. Abortion is not banned in Judaism. They're right. legal in Israel. They're free in Israel. But when you do that, you then control people via religious belief. When you get people to believe that if I want to criminalize abortion, I am on the side of God. And anyone who opposes me on that is obviously on the side of Satan. And I'm not going to sit down with Satan and negotiate things like what marriage is or school curriculum or what kind of guns I can have. Satan doesn't have to have a say in that with me. Mm -hmm. They got millions of people to subconsciously believe that you're on the side of goodness because you want to ban this thing. The Bible never gets around 
to mentioning. And that to me is the core element of how a part of fundamentalist Christianity corrupted our entire political process. Just as a generation before, they used Christianity to justify segregation in our country. True. And when that could no longer work after the late 60s, they took a decade to regroup and they came back in the late 70s, early 80s with the moral majority. And Jerry Falwell, who had been a strident segregationist, who had built whites only schools, who encouraged Americans to buy Cougarons during yeah. apartheid, suddenly he rebranded himself as the anti-abortion warrior. And it's stuck. And for 40 long years, it's driven our politics and it's driven it's, the corruption of religion and how much we hate each other. And I'm all open for a debate about abortion, but um, I'm really tired of the culture and the media just letting it be assumed that because you're Christian, you want to put women in jail for abortion. So the let's, let's, not, let's not let's set some set some context here so people understand um, how both of us come at this, because the interesting thing is one of the one of the very interesting points about John when I first met you. Um, I want to speak to the third person because you're right there uh, in Zoom. Um, is um, uh, your background uh, in in Christianity and particularly the Catholic uh, tradition and mine were very similar. Your your dad was a former priest. Your mother was a former nun, right? If I if I got uh, my that, dad was a Franciscan brother, a Franciscan uh, brother. Yeah. Uh, I of course when we would met. Um, had been um, for about 10 or so years out of the Augustinian order. That's right. Uh, so we kind of connected on this level. And folks, John and I have had these, these wonderful debates about faith, tradition, morals, culture, all of that. And while we may disagree on certain elements, at the end of the day, the baseline is pretty much the same. And I, and I was struck Almost. by a quote that you said, and you touched on it, uh, when you were discussing Christianity in America, you said Christianity, quote, is under attack in America and is under attack by those who claim that they're Christians. Damn yeah. near fell off my couch in agreement on that, because that's exactly what's at the root of this. And you just touched on the evolution of this going back, really going back to the John Birch Society yes, sir. Um, in the early uh, 60s, late 50s where there was this this emergence of faith and religion using faith as a as a tool to achieve your political e uh, uh, ends uh, and that sort of came to a head with the moral majority when reagan cut that deal to get the nomination put that pro-life plank in the party's platform which had never been there before even given all the turmoil post row in 73 74 that wasn't a push in 74 or 76 to put to to integrate culture into the politics of the party that way how how now that that's happened where does that leave christianity in america today and, and where do you think it's headed well i i just i want to say i think it goes back even earlier than that i think okay. it goes back to the first christians to set foot in our hemisphere under columbus and it's very important to remember that when Columbus was committing these evil, genocidal, unchristian acts against the indigenous people, chopping hands off of men, widespread rape, widespread murder, when they were erecting crosses on the beach and doing this in the name of Jesus, we have to also remember that it was the priest on Columbus's boat, Father Bartolomeo de las Casas, who wrote back to the queen and protested the the outrages that he witnessed so we have to remember that there's always been this history of christianity being a force of cruelty in in this country and there's always been a history of christianity resisting that cruelty and fighting for what christ actually talked about in this country True. the first act of protest ever by a european in this hemisphere was a catholic priest so that goes through slavery the abolitionists were christians and the slave owners were christians through jim crow as well where it leaves us now is in this deeply divided place um, where, you know, I would love a government based on Christian values. And this is something that gets me estranged from everyone because okay. liberals don't want to hear it. And conservatives want to hear it until I say the values of Christ. Right, the right. Are not how shitty can I be to migrant families at the borders? You know, consistently, and this is what makes me crazy about, uh, and again, not talking conservative Christianity. I'm about the separation of church and hate. I'm talking about the fundamentalists. Right. Because the extreme right wing of every religion, the Muslims, the Jews, 
the the Hindus, the, the, the Christians. It's always the extreme right wing, the fundamentalists of every faith. They're the ones responsible for keeping women down, for keeping gay people down, for thinking violence is okay if our side does it because we're on God's team. It's always the fun. The majority of moderate and liberal and conservative Christians, Muslims, and Jews are getting along just fine right now. Right. It's always the True. extreme right wing of every faith responsible for it. And the question is going to be, in the generations going forward, how much control will fundamentalists have over religion and how much control will religion have over the minds of future generations. Gallup began taking their poll on religion in America in 1937, and it was always about 76% of Americans, decade after decade, identified with a church, a synagogue, or a, or right. a mosque. Um, around 2000, it went down to 70%. But it's roughly stayed in the 70-ish range since Gallup began. As of 2020, it was down to 47% for the first time in history. Less than half of Americans identify as members of a specific church or mosque or synagogue. That doesn't mean people are atheist. It doesn't mean people don't no, believe it doesn't. In, in, the, in a creator. It doesn't mean people don't dig Jesus. It doesn't mean people aren't still in love with the great mystery and seeking what the answers are. It means people are fed up with organized religion. And I think it's because our media for all my life has known fundamentalists are great villains. They are great bad guys to have on camera. Jerry Falwell, no one in media thinks he's a great Christian. They think he's a great eyeball magnet for ratings, mm -hmm. for clicks. Mm -hmm. So you put these ungodly televangelists on because you know they're evil. You know they're villains. The problem with that is we grow up thinking that's real Christianity. I grew up in an America where you were either an atheist or you're screaming at women outside clinics. Choose one lane. And I think people are rejecting that. They say the largest growing religious group, Michael, in America are Mormons. I think the largest growing religious group are people who were raised Christian or raised religious, but now consider themselves spiritual because they're turned off to all the hypocrisies they've grown up around with organized religion. I think fundamentalism is an atheist factory, and America is proof of that. I, I think that there's there's a there's validity to to that uh, to the extent that you watch how. Uh, this is playing out across the spectrum of faiths that we have. The, you have this downtick in the number of individuals within those those faiths saying, I'm less and less identifying with the leadership yes, or sir. With, with certain tenets that are being espoused. Um, and how how does that then reshape the the landscape if i if i'm less quote religious meaning i'm adhering to you know a particular faith tradition and more spiritualist much more uh individually in my journey in that i read my bible and i try to follow uh the beatitudes and the teachings of christ um or i yeah. read my quran and i'm following the tenets uh of um muhammad how does that, what does that do structurally? Does, you know what, you know what I'm getting at? I, mean, I so know what you mean. I mean, you know, it, it leads to the breakdown in institutions. Maybe it means that this is a, a vast underserved market. Uh, maybe right. it means that, you know, the, the, the great religions of the world that we've grown up around, at least in this country, are going to be out of business. I mean, I live in New York City. I can't tell you how many beautiful churches of my childhood are now condos. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, maybe it means that, you know, something better is around the corner. I mean, I look around and I, I see so many ways that we have gotten more Christian as a society. I mean, for me, the, the dropping of homophobia, it's profoundly Christian and it's happened in my lifetime. It's profoundly in line with what Christ talked about. Um, I, I look at student loan debt forgiveness. The Bible calls for a jubilee year for debt forgiveness every seven years. I mean, you know, we all see things that make us happy, so we think they're good because they ag we agree with the politics of it. Right. But I, for every area where you show me Americans have gotten crueler, I'll show you areas where we've gotten kinder. And what got me crazy about the, the Trump Christians was, look, in the Bible, Christ, whether you believe it is literal fact or not, atheists, you, you, you don't have to believe any of this as, as, as real, but the character of Jesus in the book consistently stands up for who? 
whoever's hated, whoever's on the bottom of the heap, the most marginalized, the lepers, the so, poorest so, of the poor, the prostitutes, the uh, even even the despised foreign minorities like Samaritans. Right. But Trump, it was the most marginalized people are the ones we're going to shit on. The Syrian refugees or the Christian refugees that are so born. John, how, so, so you make the point, and I, and I agree with the point, and this is always a thing that kind of makes me scratch my head. Tell me. How the hell do Christians get that so wrong? How do they look at the teachings of the man whose name they bear as as their religious identifier, right? Yeah. And I and I I had this thought the other day, and I'm sitting here at my desk, and I'm thinking, you know what I concluded? Or oh, the question for me is, when did Christians stop being Christian? And you and I go back and and I touch on I'm like, oh, okay. The Inquisition. <laughs> Not a bad answer. But even further back, you know when they you know when they stopped being Christian? When? The moment they realized they'd attained power. Fascinating. In history. From the moments they're in the arena, you're right. About to be sacrificed to lions. That's one moment. And then you look at the arc to the point where. They're sitting in the arena. They're not in, not on the soil about to share, spread, uh, have their blood shed uh, no, for their they're, faith. They're taking over Rome. They're now they're now on the coin because the emperor has become a Christian. Yeah, and so from that that for me it was just really kind of a weirdly profound moment i was like it's true i mean look we when we start when they started getting the power when they got to make the decisions about what was christian who was christian was when christianity stopped being about christianity i i couldn't agree more look at look isn't it true that um we celebrate Christmas on December 25th because that was the feast of the Roman god Mithra. Yes. They were piggybacking Jesus's birthday onto an already existing holiday. It's the original commercialization of Christmas. <laughs> you know, Jesus was a guy who said you have to sell all your belongings and give the money to the poor. And now his birthday props up capitalism because it's all about buying things. Yeah. It's Irony, Michael, I find is a religion that will never let us down. <laughs> that's so true. It's always been there. Yeah. And that that's why, you know, it's it's all these great stories about religion. The villains are always the ones who are so pious and selling themselves as the most holy. Jesus warns us in Matthew 6, 5, not to trust the people praying in public so they can be seen. Yeah. He literally says to go pray in secret. In secret. And he gives the words to the Our Father. Like the, it's, and the, we're reminded of that every Lent. I mean, it just, just, yeah. to re, just put it out there. Just the next six weeks, I don't want you out here with ash, ashes all over your head and running around. You do this in secret. So where, why, where, how have Christians gotten this so wrong that you now have the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world standing up claiming for all of us yeah. that we you know we are you know a christian nation and national you know christian christianity is what we should be doing i mean what this does not end well if that's the attitude and the approach well and again this is because the democratic party and the u.s media have chosen to cede all spirituality and religion to the far right they do not challenge these assertions. Yeah. When Mike Pence, as governor of Indiana, passed the Religious Freedom Act, which essentially gave you the freedom to deny goods and services to gay taxpaying citizens, my first response, where, where does Jesus drive the gay wedding cakes out of the temple? Right. Like, like where I, I get it. You're 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 pretend it's one thing to pretend that Jesus hates the same people you have hangups about. Right. But, but no one in the media ever, and I mean ever. Ask Mike Pence, where in the Bible does Christ condemn same-sex relationships? No one in the media ever asked him because it is just assumed. And when you, you and when you do, when you do, and I literally just had this discussion with a friend of mine uh, who sent me all of these uh, uh, quotes from the Bible, but it was the Old Testament. Always, always, Michael. They will quote Paul 
a little bit. And Paul, yeah, Paul, Paul, yes. Paul, yeah. Paul, you know, I always say Jesus is like this incredibly liberal uh, celebrity, and Paul is his have, deeply conservative PR guy. And and, and can, just as a quick sidebar on Paul, I'm glad you said that because my take on Paul has always been... Tell me, I know what you're going to say. That Paul tried to turn Christianity into the thing that he was promoting before he became Christian, which gets back to this whole thing for me about how we lost sight of Christ. Always. He started He started articulating this emerging Christianity in the form, in the manner of the old rubrics and yeah. language of Old Testament Judaism. Yeah. I mean, so he just wanted to put a conservative imprimata on this new thing, yeah. essentially. And again, there's some a lot of good stuff from Paul. I but agree. I can understand I, that this beautiful language, beautiful language. This from Paul. ain't all. This ain't all Christ talk. Christ. And Paul, Paul, write, Paul writes about religion so well. I mean, we quote Paul. We quote Paul in weddings more than we quote Jesus because he wrote so beautifully about love. Yes, I would say that Jesus was the most feminist character in the Bible. And that Paul is the uh, least feminist character in the New Testament, to put it mildly. Yes. John Shelby Spong of the Archdiocese of Newark was the first one to introduce me to the theory that Paul was a closeted gay man in first century Holy Land. And if you read his letters with that in the back of your mind, it's a whole new experience because you see this guy who can forgive any sinner. All sinners are forgiven. What he can't forgive is the unhur unholy urges of his own evil, sinful flesh. Can't forever forgive that. It's fascinating trying to figure this guy out. But they'll quote Paul and they'll say, well, all scripture is God breathed, but they won't ever quote Jesus. And, and that's what it comes back to. With Mike Pence, I, I was like, why doesn't the media ask him? where do you get off saying that being gay is bad? You don't follow Leviticus. If you believe the book of Leviticus, you have to right. stone children to death for being gluttons and drunks. You've got to stone people to death for working on Saturday. You've got to stone adulterers to death. And I'll let y'all work that out with Donald Trump you know, on your own. <laughs> so, so I think it, it's happened that this has happened to religion because we're not like the Jews. We're not debating what God wants over the dinner table, like the Jewish families I grew up around. Right. We're, we have this assertion that we own Jesus, we own God, we're better than you, we're going to heaven. Donald Trump is fine, because even though he makes a mockery of everything Christ talked about, he's against abortion. And I ask my, my Trump-loving Christian friends all the time, please cite one actual teaching of Jesus that Trump is not the opposite of. One teaching of Christ that Trump has fought for legislatively. Michael, in six years, I've never gotten one. What I've gotten is an education into how little our conservative Trump Christian friends have read the Bible. One is always abortion, which Christ doesn't against. Two is always strong border. There's nothing in the Bible about borders or immigration at, except welcome the stranger. That's I was going to say, they know the story of the Good Samaritan, right? <laughs> oh, no. More like the gullible <laughs> cuck Samaritan, Michael. The gullible <laughs> cuck Samaritan. And number three, I always get is uh, moving, our em moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. And I've got to be like, okay, the U.S. Embassy isn't mentioned in the Bible because the U.S. <laughs> isn't mentioned in the Bible. <laughs> So it's like, it's right there, Michael, we're dumb because we let ourselves be. And I'm not into, I, I never attack people of faith, but Jesus taught me to make fun of hypocrites. And I'd like to see the Democratic Party and the corporate media make fun of start challenging the conventional yeah. wisdom on what constitutes Christianity. If I'm in a Rolling Stone cover band, but we don't play any songs the Rolling Stones played, <laughs> where do I get off calling myself a Rolling Stones cover band? No, you're not. No, that's just exactly not what you're going to be called. Ask, uh, ask, your, ask your Trump Christian loved ones to cite one teaching from the Gospels that that he's not the opposite of, and, and watch what happens. Yeah, it's it's like it's like it's like you get see their eyes get stuck on and they're like ah, uh, and they they want to hates, deflect to something else. Nobody hates like a Christian who's just been told that hate isn't Christian. Hmm. But you know what? But you know mm -hmm. what? I, I, I'm tired, Mr. Steele. I'm tired of watching the faith of my mother and father be used as a Trojan horse yeah. for policies like Donald Trump. I'm tired of watching a, a movement based on compassion and empathy 
turned into a cloaking device for meanness. Yeah, I, I could not agree with you more. And I just got sick of it. It's just one of the things that for me, um, and it was particularly galling and difficult when I was chairman uh, at times. And I was always trying to be very, very careful about that because, you know, the stuff they would put in front of you, <laughs> that you they want you to go out and talk about. It's like, I can't say this shit out and loud because it goes against what I believe in. I can't. Yeah. You know, oh, you know, the, the whole litany of stuff about a Bar Barack Obama and Hillary. I'm like, I'll go after Hillary and Obama on policy exactly. and, you know, just the political stuff. But, you know, calling these people demons and devils and, and all this other stuff is just blasphemous. It, it is in so many ways. We're we're having great conversation, as I knew we would, with my buddy John Fugel saying we're going to take a quick break when we come back. We're going to go even further. Oh, no. <laughs> We're going to go even further with John Fugel saying right after this. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, it's Michael Steele podcast. Uh, I'm hoping you're enjoying the conversation as much as I am with John Fugel saying, comedian, host of Sirius XM's Tell Me Everything. Uh, so, John, we've got we've got this um, this Halloween uh, season, an election coming up, and I put the two together because it's scary as hell. <laughs> it is scary as hell right now watching how everything we just talked about how the how politics is using faith and religion as a cudgel to beat into submission um the american people using guilt and and christianity and other things uh to do that now you get to the point where folks are going to go vote and they're going to go as express their political will, if you, if you will. Yes, um, how, how are you assessing where we are right now on, on that front? Um, particularly when you consider, for example, uh, and you talked about the media and its coverage of, of matters of faith and, and morals, but also in politics, how they've talked about and covered uh the Oz campaign in Pennsylvania, the Walker campaign in um Georgia. Um what what's your take on things right now? Well I know the media that I consume uh really wants Democrats to stay home because it's over. That's what I know. Um I, I I'm amazed at you know how even though we've learned in the last couple of elections that polling is not as reliable as we'd like to think it is. Mm -hmm. I mean I still think of polling as people who answer their landline phones during dinner hours and people who look at their cell phone, see a number they don't know and choose to pick it up and answer it. Right. So that's, that's the sampling we're getting with, with polls. Um, having said that, this is America. And we know that in America, things generally always have to get worse before they start to get better. I know that with this election, like all others, if there's a high turnout, it'll help Democrats. If there's low turnout, it'll help Republicans. I believe over 60% of Americans will have a chance to vote for an election denying candidate this year. That's what the media calls them, Michael, election deniers. I know. Because that's a more tasteful term than liars, demonstrable liars. Mm -hmm. And Democrats yeah. are trying to scare the hell out of all of us by letting us know that democracy itself may be at stake. <laughs> but they're right. I mean, Carrie Lake is on the record. I've met Carrie Lake and I don't believe she believes in anything. I do believe she believes in Carrie Lake and mm -hmm. Carrie Lake has promised that she will help bring about a system that will throw out the vote, the will of the American people if she doesn't like it. And we've seen these measures passed all over the place now. Yeah, um, they, they, they can't win in democracy. So instead of updating their ideas, they're going to subvert democracy. And that's what so much of our election is about to begin. I mean, so the electoral college, uh, gerrymandering, the voter ID laws. It's all about making sure the will of the majority is not heard. Um, but, you know, I also know a lot of Democrats who want to jump off the roof on all of this. And I'm like, we know what's going to happen. If, if, if they take over the House and Kevin McCarthy takes the gavel from Nancy Pelosi, it will be the beginning of the most gruesome experience of Kevin McCarthy's life he will be 
eaten alive by yeah. his own caucus. Yeah. Every day of his will be a waking misery where he tries to enjoy the power he worked 25 years to achieve while also being a sock puppet for Donald Trump for having mm -hmm. Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren yeah. Boebert ridiculing him every chance they get. Yeah. And they're going to achieve nothing. They will accomplish nothing. It's not going to go any differently than the last time the GOP controlled the Congress. So I, 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 what I say to people all the time on, on my show and my podcast, a lot of folks are very down. And I say, look, when we're old, we're still going to be fighting for the same things. Yeah. When you're old, you're still going to be fighting for women's rights and for children and for the poor and for immigrants and LGBT, whoever, you know, if you're the kind of person who cares about what Jesus called the least of these, you're still going to be fighting for these causes when you're old. So don't let the news make you insane. Don't let the politics of this country rob you of your joy live a good life be happy and don't let a bad election destroy your joy be bigger than that and keep on fighting in every way possible but despair is is privilege despondency is privilege there's no room for it do your crying and then get back in the race because we got to keep fighting to save democracy the fascists and the racists are always going to show up the rest of us have to try to get the rest of us to do it too I, I I love that, and and I think it, it 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 I think captures a lot of sort of the frustration I have uh, as I as I travel around. I was just in Indiana uh, last week. Uh, you know, I'll be uh, actually back there uh, this week uh, for a separate event, different event. Um, Chicago, New York, out west, and it's all the same. It doesn't matter whether you're on the West Coast, the East Coast, whether you're in the Southwest or the Midwest, this the attitude you just tapped into is 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 pervasive. And I think I think one of the many MINI successes of this right wing ascendancy is getting people to believe more fervently today than we ever have in history that we're helpless. Yeah that we can't change this, it's inevitable. And the inevitability isn't them, the right wing bullshit and, and the racism and the hatred that they're promulgating. I mean, Viktor Orban, seriously, are you kidding me, right? That's the country we want to, the, the style of leadership we want. That's not the, that's not the thing. The thing that they want us to feel afraid of and be afraid of is the very thing that you and I've just been talking about, what Christianity requires of yeah, us. That's it. That's you it. know, and, and the thing about Christianity, we'll put it in that box, but the tenants, love thy neighbor as thyself, the number one thing, no matter on all and the gospel, what is the, number, the greatest number two thing? Number two thing. Yeah. yeah. Number yeah. one thing is love God with all love your Love God, right. The number, the number two thing but I was taking into account those who are atheists and didn't believe in God, right? So, right <laughs> so, so at the end of the day, the one thing that you are asked to do above all other things when it comes to your fellow man and woman is to what? Love them as you would love yourself. Treat them as you would treat yourself. And so I just find it fascinating that people are so readily capable and willing to just walk away from that though that that's that's, that's 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 the history of religion around the world i mean every culture has people who do that it's spiritually lazy people who want to have the appearance of piety but they don't want to break a sweat doing it every mm -hmm. religion we, we, and, and that's there's lazy liberal christians and lazy conservative christians too right they like to throw this phrase around, cafeteria Christian, right? Like you just pick and choose the parts you want to believe. Well, that's everybody. Everyone picks and chooses the parts they want to believe. Most people don't believe that angels fell to earth and had sex with humans and gave birth to giants <laughs> who walked the earth. And that's in the book of Genesis. It is. People will argue that they believe in the talking snake, but they don't believe in the giants. You know why? They haven't read that far. <laughs> it's like 10 pages in. So, it, you know, like... We're all, we're all. And the print up. is so small. But like, <laughs> no one believes all of this stuff, right? And nor should they. It's mythology. I always say there's, there's not a lot of, there's a lot of truth in the Bible. There's not a lot of facts, but there is a lot of truth. And so, so it's, it's a lot easier to 
to go through life and just be spiritually lazy, Jesus is um, pretty inconvenient as messiahs go. You know, people like to worship him as a God because that's a lot easier than following his inconveniently progressive I say that teachings. all the time. That is and so it happens, true. And, and by the way, liberals don't own him either. I mean, but when I was growing up down south, I always saw this bumper sticker that said, Christians aren't better, just saved. And that to me was always the problem. It's literally the opposite of what I believe. You know, in the Catholic faith, you know, they'll say, oh, you're saved. You accept Jesus. Congratulations, Ringo. That's step one, back of the line. <laughs> but I've met so many people who think because I accept God as I accept Jesus as my savior, that I got to get out of hell free card. Yeah. I can be as shitty to anybody as I want because I accept the Lord Jesus as my savior. And I have John 316 on a, on a sign somewhere. Right. And I want to put women in jail for abortion. And none of that has anything to do with what Jesus asks of you in the gospels. So all I'm saying is let's get back to what Christianity is supposed to be about. Ironically, the more liberal you are, the more conservative a Christian you are. And atheists can get in on this too. I would love to see more atheists cite scripture in debates. And, and also my dream is to see atheist groups and religious groups working together. Like if your church is out there trying to do something to help homelessness, why not ask a local atheist group to work with you? That would be the most positive thing I ever saw. I'm a big fan of all the positive ways people can come together to help others that we haven't even invented yet. Right. And when Gen Z is done fixing climate change and getting us all single payer health care, I can't wait to see how they fix religion too. Well, it's, it's so you, we can't get there because we do have, we still have, people that we are electing uh, and people that we're putting into power who do not have that particular mooring about them. Of course. You know, so so for me, you know, as I've shared with with uh, folks who listen to my podcast, and, and if you know me, I've had this conversation with you at some point, I'm sure, that a lot of what governs my behavior has been those years I spent in a seminary. Amen. It reframed my my look, my outlook of the world. And it helped me become more Christ-centered. In other yes. words, to see Christ in others as I would hope to see him in myself. And that's the hard part. And that's, and that's hard as hell, baby. A lot of liberals fall short there as well. Because if if you let your whoever hates a brother and sister is not in the light. And if you let yourself hate someone, not only are you violating the tenet you're supposedly believing, but hate makes us stupid. And Twitter proves it every day. <laughs> you and I have seen intelligent people we admire. I know. Become anger-driven twits yeah. on that platform. I mean, we, we have the lessons. We know hate makes you sick. We know hate gives you cancer. And even more so, my deepest spiritual belief, Michael, is this little tendon I have, which is that happy people aren't dicks. That if you are happy and in a good place and centered and spiritual, whatever you're just <laughs> you're, you're good, you don't want to be mean or hateful to someone else. When you're when you're happy, when you're in a place of great joy, the last thing you want is to go find people you disagree with politically and fight and hate them. So you know it's always coming from a place of pain. I have to remind myself that anyone who attacks me and calls me a baby killing communist that clearly. A, my child's 10. I failed at the baby killing. Right, and, right. And, and B, you know, they wouldn't act that way if they weren't in pain. I have to remind myself when I'm unfairly attacked on social media <laughs> that that's because someone else is in pain and I have the choice of how I respond. Is that the driver? Is that, do you see that as a, as a major driver today um, in, in a lot of, uh, our cultural and uh, life experiences that beneath yes. all of that is this, politics. this pain that's going on. So what what is where is that pain emanating from? And why why is this generation unable to channel that pain in a way that the greatest generation did? Because I couldn't imagine I couldn't imagine this generation having to confront the realities of a world war, a great recession, um, racial tensions, all those things that that define the period from the 19 early 1930s sure. to 1950, right? Sure. And and yet and still begin to put in place however 
difficult and choppy at times it was, the building blocks that you and I now stand on where we have a Voting Rights Act, a Civil Rights Act, we have, you know, the turn back on, on Jim Crow, yes. we have the turnaround in the global posture of the United States. Well, in fairness, you got to remember that the greatest generation did all that, but it was also the greatest generation that was trying to block all that. True. And this was a time when you had liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats. Yeah. You know, yes, Democrats were behind segregation, uh, conservative Southern Democrats and conservative Southern Republicans. There was many progressive Republicans and Democrats who were opposed to Jim Crow. But the generation now has had to deal with a terrorist attack on our country that led to a monstrous illegal war on our part. Mm -hmm. We've had to deal with a plague that killed a million of us. We've had to deal with um, a middle class that we were born into that we thought would still be here 40 years ago. And so every generation is given its own set of challenges. The greatest generation sure had to deal with stuff that we couldn't imagine having to deal with. But I, I don't want to sell young people or any gen or Gen X or anyone else short because you know, middle class. Yeah, I'm not wrapping it just exclusively on their end. I'm talking about all of us who are alive at this moment in time. So as those of us right. like well, myself were at the end of the baby at the end of the baby boomers, right? Late yeah. I'm late 50s, 58. Um, and then, you know, those of us who are in this position today, you're right, to, to deal with this, we're not dealing with it well, or as well as I think we could, is I guess my question. I, I agree completely, but I would also say, look at how far we've come in many different ways. We have a biracial female vice president. Uh, marriage equality is legal. Uh, this president for now. has criminalized, yeah, for now, this president has decriminalized weed on the federal level. Um, for all of the disadvantages women have in the workplace and people of color have in the workplace, my God, they've come so far since when I was a kid. There are so many areas where we are getting better as a people, and I have to remind myself of that all the time. But I, I, honestly, and this might be our big area of disagreement, Michael, is um, I, I think it's privately funded elections. I think in an era when elections can be bought, when politicians can be bought, more or less, and this goes, this is true for many Democrats as well. We've mm -hmm. certainly seen it true of Mansion and Cinema, um, that you're not going to see progress from climate action to poverty fighting. You're not going to see progress when too much money is tied up in making sure there isn't progress. And this has always been the struggle in America. I mean, it's always been what slowed us down morally so much because, and that's good. You need a conservative force to keep the liberals from going too crazy and trying to have a revolution and, and reform right. everything. I get that. But I, I think as long as we don't have publicly funded elections and we're choosing which billionaire's candidate we like the most, we're not going to have much in the way of, of progress. All progress will continue to come from we, the people and the government. We'll always have to catch up. That seems to be how it's always been. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we probably would disagree a little bit on the money piece because I don't think money is as a great uh, contributor to the sin um, as as some would like to make it out to be because there's it's always been there. It's always been an element in some form, um, whether it's you're talking pre McCain Feingold or post um um citizens you know, united citizens united thank you it's still it's always been an element it's sure. it's how it what i would say on that piece is not so much what the political cuz the political parties basically have been written out of money the money piece of it parties can't raise money the way they they did before mccain feingold which was part of the lawsuit that i brought that instead of my lawsuit, the Supreme Court took Citizens United. Right. Um, and here we are. Um, but it's what's happening with the with within the private sector, how the private sector has become much more integrated through through the money chain um, in that it's unlimited, it's unreported, yeah. et cetera. And that's 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 actually outside of the political structure of both parties because they don't control that anymore. Um, and so th th it does, it but does. They, but they are, but they are picked. They are picked. So that's, that right. That's where I would agree with you on the back end um, on that point. Yeah, we agree then. 
So where where does where does that when you look at that whole narrative, and then you take, for example, um, how people are using getting back to w- where we started our conversation with freedom of speech. I, I, I'm thinking about Kanye, for Thank example, you. yeah, and his remarks, his anti-Semitic remarks, and what that has sparked. And then I look look at and just suppose that up against what Elon Musk was willing to promote. It, it, it's, it seems a little bit weird on one side, we're kind of like all hair on fire with Kanye and his remarks on anti-Semitism. But then Elon seemingly, and, and a lot of people coming to his defense and wanting to further promote that, okay with uh, this sort of promotion of right-wing bullshit yeah. and lies. Yeah. So does that speak to just how confused we are um sort of my tribe versus your tribe what 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 do you think accounts for some of that well i'm glad you used the word bullshit because i think you know from the era of donald trump we have to be able to separate lies from bullshit lies are if you deliberately know you're spreading a lie that's a lie right you don't know you just don't bother to check you're spreading this whether it's true or not you're passing it off as true it could be true that's bullshitting. And Donald Trump mains, mainstreamed that at a level we've never actually yeah. seen. Yeah. Um, I don't think Elon Musk was actively lying. He was actively bullshitting. And bullshitting can be obviously just as destructive as lying. And that is the first week he takes over this platform, um, letting us all know the kind of integrity we can look forward to. In the case of Kanye, it's it's heartbreaking. You know, no one talks about him as an artist ever. No, ever. no. I mean, he's not, he's a celebrity. He's not an artist anymore. He's stopping an artist years ago. He's a celebrity guy. Just put out the first narcissistic gospel album I have ever listened to. <laughs> Wouldn't think of a gospel album as being all about you, but Kanye, he cracked the code. Let me tell you, he knows <laughs> worship. Um, I know we all know what his favorite pronouns are. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yes, we many do. Ways, you know, yeah, Kanye he used to drop albums. Now he drops pogroms. You know, the <laughs> narcissism of Kanye to think that, he had the capital to get away with this um, and good for Adidas for uh, eventually realizing, you know, yeah. this was not offended by the anti-Semitism at all. They did not care about the anti-Semitism. Yeah. People cared and they made the stock drop. Adidas was responding to the response to the response to the That's anti-Semitism. It. That's it. That's yeah. it. So it's like, you know, we're, we're all, uh, to some level, we're all pretending to be smarter than we are. To some level, we're all trying to get away with as much as we are. And I think Elon and and Trump and and Kanye all have a lot in common in terms of privilege and narcissism. Um, I would point out Kanye is the one who earned his wealth. The other two were born into it. Right. Um, and and if these are going to be the kind of heroes that weak men latch on to, then we have to be ready to have a lot of facts a lot of patience and um, a, a lot of uh, fearlessness in going yeah. up against this. It's a cult of personalities and people will look, Donald Trump stole from veterans with Trump university. He stole from us veterans. It should have ended right there. Yeah. It should have ended when he mocked a, a reporter's disability. It's a cult. It's going to still be a cult. And as they replaced Bush, they will replace Trump. Don't you think, Michael? I, mean, I think Trump- you're right. I think they've already started to do that. Um, and and with on. DeSantis and Kerry Lake, that's that's the ticket of the future for, for some. I've already heard it. Yeah. Um, she believes it, uh, which is, and oh, he so believes it. At least she believes in one thing. You right, know, right. I, her, I was like, she she was like, well, I'm not a racist. I voted, I voted for Trump, but I, I voted twice for Obama. And I'm like, then what? Then you decided Obama wasn't really born here. You decided that abortion should be criminalized. You decided climate science was a myth. You decided millionaires had it rough. What did you believe in that changed? Right. And she couldn't answer the question. She said, I just like the way he speaks to me. And I'm like, then this is it. It's just going to be a popularity contest. And, and, and that's exactly what, that's my biggest fear that we we continue to elect men and women who care less about what happens to us yeah and are more concerned about what they can either get from us from the grift 
That's or it. what they think they can do to us, for example, own the libs that's um, to further a political agenda. And that's not the kind of politics I ever signed up for. No, I, I ask people all the time. I mean, what does conservatism mean in, tw in 2022? It, it doesn't mean family values. No, nope. doesn't mean oh, Christian hell no. <laughs> doesn't mean fiscal responsibility. No. Doesn't mean smaller government. I mean, it means saying smaller government, but you know, right? I mean, to me, it means obedience to this reality show clown and owning the libs, and that's it. That's it. And again, how ironic, right? Trump, I think, is the second president of the Confederacy. We've never had an American president defend the Confederacy more. And his supporters are obsessed with owning people. Okay. <laughs> what a what a club. <laughs> Sounds great. Wave your okay. flag proudly. That, that's the John Fugel saying, I know and love. The, the brother who can weave, can weave like that, dude. I didn't uh, so, mean to get preachy. Sorry. No, Thanks. that was really, so. Before I let you get out of here, what are you, what are you working on right now, and how 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 was how does this environment inform your work um, as a comedian? Sure. Certainly, but you know the your, your podcast and the other things that yeah. you're doing to try to to try to level well, people's minds a little bit. <laughs> Our Sirius XM show, and I've been very honored to have you as a guest in the past, we're we're on live in the evenings on the Progress Channel 127, um, but we're also now a podcast available the next day. So uh, if you don't have Sirius XM, you can still hear us and our guests. And one thing that's been very important to me, Michael, all along has been book a lot of celebrities, not all politics, bring a lot of comedians in. Yeah. Like you've got to balance the diet. You can't just do news, 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 news. So yeah. I've had everybody from you know, Tyler Perry to Julie Andrews to Jeff Bridges to, you know, I've had everyone from Chris Christie to, you know, Trent Lott to yeah. Howard Brown as well. But I try to have, I try to to keep a lot, of, a lot of fun, a lot of musicians, a lot of, you know, artists um, and not just suffocate on politics. Also, um, you know, I, I like going on the road. Political comedy is hard because whatever you're just going to say, you back out on the road now. You yeah, gotta, we just you... did. We, we just closed uh, the Stephanie Miller sexy liberal comedy oh. tour and oh we filmed girl. our show in L.A. It was a lot of fun. Rob Reiner was on stage with us. Uh, Glenn Kirshner. You can see that as a pay-per-view. It's the political comedy show of the year. It's really great at sexyliberal.com. dot uh, com. And then next year, I'm going to be going out with a new show that is uh, a tie in with a book I'm writing called Separation of Church and Hate. And it's going to be all my stand up about Christianity in America and how we got that way. And my own parents story of how nice. they both once promised God I would never happen. And I am proof that they broke their vows and <laughs> can't afford the therapy I need. So I'm here to do comedy. About but the, it. they didn't break their vows while they were under vows. They no, were... but they both they both left. The, yeah, they did not. Not that I know of. Although, boy, <laughs> let, when, I write, when I write the screenplay, they will. Um, <laughs> I, don't you, I don't want your mama hitting you upside your head. My dad was madly in love with my mom for 10 years in secret and couldn't tell anybody. Wow. And he, he finally got her to leave. Uh, so it was it was quite a story. And he was from Brooklyn and she was from the South. So I grew up bilingual. There's that too. <laughs> yes. So. John Fugel saying he is, he is I, 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 I'm honored to call him a friend and sure. someone I know I could convince with for <laughs> everything from politics to religion to to our friend Stephanie Miller, who is always a hoot. I love her. I love her. And folks, you got to check out this the sexy tour because it is it is good fun. Really fun. Uh, it really, really is good fun. And check out John uh, and the work he's doing over on Sirius XM with uh Tell Me Everything. You can catch it uh week every night, 7:30. Every night. It's actually nine to midnight on the East Coast, six to nine on the West Coast. Six to nine on the West. There you go. John, thank you so much, my friend. I appreciate thank you, you brother, for, for keeping it real as you always have. Thank you for all you do. I love that you do this podcast. It's an honor to talk to you and your audience. And and thank you for just being a voice of um, sincerity and kindness when it's needed most. Thank you, my friend. You got it. So that, that'll that do it for this time together, folks. You know I love it when you do that voodoo you do so well and download and, and share uh, the podcast. We really appreciate it. Check out uh, our link uh, at Steel Podcast. You can get the podcast there, Spotify, obviously, uh, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Until next time, uh, first things first, vote if you haven't. There's still a few days weeks a week left before you vote uh if you're not voting early then vote on election day 
Uh, enjoy Halloween, All Saints Day, All Souls Day. <laughs> I got to go through my collection, John, before. <laughs> As a good Catholic boy, <laughs> um, but all y'all takes it. Take care of yourselves. Be safe out there until next time. Godspeed. <laughs>